together. Right, let's rise up to our feet, please. We're going to make our declaration. Then we're going to get into God's Word together this morning. And um, So if you have your Bible, please hold it high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold, and strong. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please shake hands with the people next to you. Say hello to them. Give them a good smile. And then you may be seated, please. All right, we've been journeying through the book of Romans, uh, going through it chapter by chapter. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to cover chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, but I'm going to do it a little differently in the sense that uh, we're not going to read many verses, but I'm going to just try to summarize or just bring out the essence of these three chapters, chapters 6, 7, and 8, and talk about how it impacts our lives as believers in Jesus Christ. Let's quickly run through a review of Romans 1 through 5. Then we can pick up uh, and just get a, a quick bird's eye view of 6, 7, and 8. Paul's epistle to the Romans is one of the most powerful descriptions, revelations of the gospel of Jesus Christ and also of our journey as believers. Starting in chapter 1 where he describes the fact that God has revealed himself to us in his creation, and yet we as people have chosen to walk away from God. In chapter 2, Paul addresses the fact that God judges us according to truth, according to righteousness, according to our deeds, according to our motives. And God judges us without any partiality, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, there is no partiality with God. So he judges us. Romans 2 and Romans 3, under that judgment, all of us are declared guilty. Romans 3 verse 10, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3. So essentially, Paul has done a great job in bringing us to this place of recognizing our need before God. That, you know, uh, by default, all of us are standing judged, condemned, before Almighty God, we have sinned, and that's our position. But then he goes on to speak about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus, starting from Romans 3, verse 21 onwards, he says. And the key there is Romans 3, 24, where he says, We are justified by faith, freely by His grace. That is the good news, that God... Declare us sinners justified. That is just as if we've never sinned. That God could do that for us freely by His grace because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So that He introduces that. That's the good news. That's the great news uh, for all of us. Then in chapter 4, He emphasizes the fact that we have been made righteous by faith and faith alone. That means... We can't work our way into this. You can't be a really good person and attain righteousness because all our goodness doesn't match up to God. All we can do is by faith receive God's gift of righteousness. That's the emphasis of chapter 4. Chapter 5, he begins to say, now that we are standing righteous before God by grace, he says, here are all the wonderful things. We have peace with God. So everybody say, I have peace with God. And he says, we have this standing in grace. 
That means when God looks at you, he's looking at you with grace, with favor. We have the standing in grace. And we have this glorious hope, he says, Romans 5, verse 3. And then he says that because of this, we can even rejoice in tribulation. As I regard the tough times, we can still have the joy in us, even in the midst of difficulties, because we have this glorious hope, Romans 5. And then in Romans 5, he says, you know, he brings this truth out that our identity is no longer in Adam, but it is in Jesus Christ. Adam brought sin into this world. Death through sin. Death passed upon everybody. All of us have sinned. All of us are condemned. The good news is Jesus Christ came. He came as a last Adam, put an end to the Adamic race. He came as a second man, creating a new creation. And you and I have our identity in Jesus Christ. That's where we stop. Are you with me? So now we're going to do 6, 7, and 8. Now, having brought us this far in our spiritual journey, Paul addresses a very... A, a very important problem that all of us are facing. I, you and I, because of our faith in Jesus, have received grace, have received the gift of righteousness. We are wonderfully saved. We are standing before God, accepted and loved by God. But we all have one common problem. What is it? It's sin. How do we overcome sin? That's the main thing he's addressing in chapter 6, 7, and 8. The next stage of our spiritual journey. Wonderful. I know my sins are forgiven. I know I am righteous in the eyes of God. I know I'm accepted by God. I'm loved by God. I'm in grace. But what do I do with sin? How do I handle it? And so, you know, he begins Romans 6, verse 1, and 2, 1, 2, and 3 by asking this question. What then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, the life that we live, is it a life that we just keep on sinning because there is God's grace? Certainly not. We're still. And he says, no, we can't do that. That's not the life we are called to live where we just keep on sinning because we're under grace. That's not the kind of life. That's wrong idea. So tell your neighbor, that's the wrong idea. So if you hear that kind of teaching that sometimes, I'm sorry to say, but that's so prevalent in the Christian world today, the teaching on grace that excuses you or releases you to sin as you want, that's not what is taught in the New Testament. Are you with me? So be careful of that because that's very popular these days. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's from God. Okay? Go back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? What did Paul say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who are dead indeed unto sin live any longer therein? Now, let, I'll come back to these details a little later. But let's get a bird's eye view of verses chapter 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6, 7, and 8. So we will do a little bit of preaching instead of teaching, right? Okay. Bird's eye view of chapter 6, 7, and 8. What is he saying? In chapter 6, he says, this is God's answer to the problem of sin. What is it? He kills us. He says, God kill has killed. He has put to death the old man. So just say this with me. The old man has been crucified. So what is the old man? It's the nature inside us. So our human spirit has a nature. It's either the old man or the new man. The old man represents the sinful nature out of Adam. The new man represents God's nature out of Jesus Christ. So what did God do? He killed the old man. He put an end to it so that the power of sin might be broken. Right? So say this with me. The power of sin over my life has been broken. It was done at the cross. Amen? That's what happened at the cross. So that's Romans 6. We'll get into a little bit more detail. We'll come back. We're giving a bird's eye view now. So the power of sin, the old man has gone. Power of sin over our lives has been broken. 
So technically, we should be free from sin. But there is a problem. That's Romans 7. What is the problem? Paul says, in my flesh, something is still controlling me. So in our spirit, we are a new man. But there's a problem in the flesh. When the Bible uses the word flesh, don't think about steak. <laughs> in a bro- <laughs> I don't know what you like. Fried chicken. <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. Okay. The flesh is talking about the sinful desires of the soul and the body. So our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and the body has its sinful desires. The whole thing is called flesh in the New Testament. So Paul says, I have a problem. It's my flesh. I still have wrong desires in my body. What do I do? And the problem is so great. Paul describes it in Romans 7. He says, in my inward man, I want to do the will of God, but the thing that I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I don't want to do, that's the thing I end up doing. Why? Because there is sin present in my flesh. Now, this is a problem for all of us. All right? So let's not pretend to be any angels here. (laughs) We are all human beings. We all live in a spirit, soul, and body. This is our problem. We are new man on the inside. But we all struggle with our soul, with the wrong desires of the soul and the body. Now, whether you're a Christian for nine days or 90 years, as long as you have flesh, as long as you have mind and body, this is a problem. You can say amen. (laughs) It is. So, Paul, that's Romans 7. He describes the problem. He addresses the reason. It's because sin is present in my flesh. The sin that's controlling. So what is the answer? That is Romans chapter 8. The answer is very simple. It's one thing. Walk in the spirit. What is the answer? Walk in the spirit. So God's made you a new person in your, inside you. We still have problems in the flesh. What's the answer? Walk in the... That means to walk yielded to the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 8. It says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of your flesh. That means the power of the Holy Spirit will enable you and me to overcome these sinful desires. And then he gets into a little detail there in Romans six, uh, Romans 8 when he talks about How do we make this transition? We've got to move from being carnally minded to becoming spiritually minded. Make that transition. That means don't folk, to be carnal means to be fleshly. It's another word for flesh. Okay. To be carnally minded means you're focused on the things of the flesh. But don't be carnally minded. Be spiritually minded. Be get your interests, interests up in the things of the spirit. And then he says, when you walk according to the spirit, Yielded to the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 verse 13, we will put to death the sinful deeds of our body. Amen? Finished. That's it. Romans 6, 7, and 8. You got it. That's the message in these three chapters. The key for every believer living victorious over sin. But now let's get into a little bit of detail. Is it okay? Let's go to Romans 6. So Paul begins there, Romans 6 verse 1. He says, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? Romans 6 verse 2. So tell your neighbor, I'm dead to sin. So that's the position of the believer. As a believer, we are dead to sin. You say, but when did I die? Verse 3. Knowing this, that as many of us have been baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. He says, look, God did something. Now, 
when we were baptized into Christ, he's talking about, you know, water baptism. So water baptism is very important. I want to encourage you to do that. But it's not, water baptism is symbolic of a spiritual thing that God has done. What did God do? He immersed us into Christ. That means he identified us in Christ even before we were born. In fact, even before the world was created, Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, Before the foundation of the world, he chose us in Christ. Do you know you were in Christ even before the foundation of the world? That means this took place all in the mind of God even before he created the first speck of dirt on the earth. He finished this work. Hebrews 4 verse 3 says, He finished all of this even before he began. In the mind of God, the work was completed before it actually started. What did God do? He put us in Christ, every human being in Christ, so that when Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was buried, you and I were buried. When Christ was raised up, you and I were raised up. When Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, you and I were seated. All this was done even before the creation of the world. Now in time, when you and I are born and believe in Jesus, then this becomes a reality in our lives. Are you with me? But this reality was established in the spirit before time began. So what did God do? Romans 6 verse 6. Knowing this. Are the notes coming up? Right. Romans 6 verse 6. Or you can look at it in your Bibles. Knowing this. This is something you and I need to know. So tell your neighbor. Knowing this. See God says my people are destroyed because they don't know. They have lack of knowledge. Or Isaiah 5.13 says, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. You need to know. That's why listening to the word is so important. What must we do? Romans 6 verse 6. Knowing this. Knowing what? That our old man was crucified with him. So when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, this old sinful nature that we received from Adam was nailed to the cross. What do we mean by nature? You can use modern terminology. You can say it's your DNA. The DNA of your spirit. That's nature. It's your predisposition. It's your inclination. That's nature. That old sinful nature. The old man refers to the old sinful nature. That was nailed to the cross. So say this with me. I do not have an old man. I am a new man. See, the old sinful nature was crucified. If it's crucified, it's dead. For what? What will happen? That the body, Romans 6 verse 6, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That we henceforth should no longer serve sin. So this is a truth you and I should know. If we don't know it, sin will still dominate us. But if we know it, then we are one step into our freedom. Are you with me? You should know. What should you know? Know that that old sinful nature is gone. It's gone. On the cross. Broken. Power of sin. The body of sin might be done away with. Broken. Destroyed. So that we no longer should serve sin. Because he, verse 7, he who is dead is freed from so really, that inner person, is that old man is dead. So think about this. Think about an alcoholic, right? I mean, this guy is, think about this guy who, when he woke up in the morning, instead of drinking coffee or tea or water, he drinks some alcohol. And he is this beyond redemption guy. <laughs> but he dies. He's dead. Now you can place around his body all his best, most favorite bottles of liquor. Not even the little finger will move. No response. Because he is dead. That's you and me. He who is dead is freed from sin. Are you with me? Yes, no, maybe, somewhere. <laughs> 
He who is dead is freed from. You are dead. I am dead. The old man is dead. And so you and I are free from sin. We need to announce and let sin know. Sin, I'm dead. I'm free. So knowing this, it's very important. Right? Then, how do I apply that identificational truth? How do I apply it in my life? He begins to talk to us about that from verses 11 to 14. Romans 6, 11 to 14. Verse 11. Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Reckon means to count as a fact. It's that same accounting word which was used earlier in the earlier chapters as he accounted it to Abraham as righteousness. It was imputed to him. Same word. Reckon to count as a fact. So if I give you Ten, uh, 10 rupee notes. How much is it? How much do you have? If I give you 10, 10 rupee notes, how much do you have? Are you sure? If you count it from the top to bottom, how much will it be? Come on, guys. This is just an example. Top to bottom, how much will it be? Bottom up. Middle up both ways, how much? It is, it is 100. It will not change, however you look at it. It is 100. That's reckoning. Now you're doing your accounting. You can count it up, count it down, sideways. 100 is 100. Reckon. So he says, verse 11, Romans 6, 11. Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto? Count it as a fact. I mean, no arguments about this. I am dead to sin. Reckon it to be so counted as a fact. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So in verses Romans 6, 11 to 14, he gives five action points. And I'm going to just mention those five. First, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Second, do, do not present yourselves unto unrighteousness. Do not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves unto God. And number five, present your members, your bodily parts as instruments of righteousness to God. So this is what he says. Because God has set you free, you do this. First, count it as a fact. I am dead to count it as a fact. No arguments. I am dead. Two things don't do. Don't present yourself to unrighteousness. Don't present your bodily members as unrighteous. Instead, two things you do. Yield yourselves to God and your members, your bodily parts, unto God. The best way to do this is by affirming truth. It's as simple as when you wake up in the morning or any time of the day or any time you're tempted, you just say this. I declare I am dead to sin. And if you want, you can call that sin by name. I declare I'm dead to pornography. So there could be people sitting here who are struggling with pornography. I declare I'm dead to lustful looking. People sitting here could have lustful eyes. I mean, you, a girl passes by and your head also turns. So can you imagine you're stopping down the street, your head is turning. I'm just joking, right? <laughs> I mean, we could have all kinds of issues. Believers, I'm talking about believers. Tongue talking, devil chasing, Bible reading believers still have problems. How do you get out of it? Here's Paul's answer. God's answer through Paul. Number one, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto. So you say, I am dead to this thing. I'm dead to pornography. I'm dead to lustful eyes. I'm dead to, you know, uh, uh, unclean fantasizing. That could be somebody's addiction. I am dead to you know, whatever. I'm dead. Reckon yourself dead. I refuse to present my body as an instrument of that thing, that unrighteousness. But I present my body as an instrument of righteousness unto God. Got it? In the remaining part of Romans 6, that's verse 15 through 23, summarize that for us. Paul makes this important thing. He says, you know, in the past, you were a slave. Now, under grace, you're still a slave. 
So tell your neighbor, under law, you were a slave. Under grace, you're still a slave. Let's say it again. Under law, you were a slave. Under grace, you're still a slave. Just that your master is different. Amen? He used the same word, julos. Julos means bond servant. Bond servant is a servant who has committed himself by his choice to his master for the rest of his life to do what pleases the master. That's a slave. So he says, under law you are slaves to sin, slaves to uncleanness, slaves to lawlessness. Under grace you're still a slave, but you're a slave to righteous, you're a slave to God and you're a slave to righteousness. So say this with me. Under grace, I'm a slave. I'm still a slave, but I'm a slave to God and to righteousness. Amen. So that's the rest of Romans 6, 15 to 23. We are slaves. It's a choice we make. There's a difference. Under sin, sin says, I'm not giving you a choice. I'm taking over. Under grace, we make the choice. We present ourselves. Paul says, present yourselves un as slaves unto God. And unto righteousness. Amen? So God has done a work for us. What has he done? He's destroyed the old man on the cross. He's broken the power of sin. You don't have the old man. You have a new man. But our first step is to present ourselves unto God. Amen? And you do that by the words of your mouth. You say, God, I present myself completely to you. My mind, my emotions, my appetites, my sexual appetites, my eating ap desires. Yeah, whatever. My sleeping desires. <laughs> whatever. Whatever is causing you trouble. Lord, my whole, all my desires, all my appetites, I am presenting it to you. But it's under grace. It means God is not going to force you to do it. It's your choice. Amen? But now, even after we do that, bad fellow is still around. It's called the flesh. That means, now let me just highlight a couple of things there. In Romans 6, verse 14, he says, sin will not have dominion over you. So that's something, that's a truth we have to embrace. Sin will not have dominion over me. Whatever. It will not have dominion over me. The other important thing he brings out in Romans 6, 17 and 18 is, you know, he, he makes this amazing statement to the believers at Rome. Oh, okay. Well, let me just point this out to you. And uh, Verse 17 and 18, he says, God be thanked that you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine unto which you were delivered or which was delivered to you, being set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Very important. Because he says, you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was given to you. You see, doctrine, that word, that word in the Greek, that form, the word in, in the Greek is very beautiful. It's, it's, meta, it's metaphor. It's talking about a dye in which you pour molten metal in order to cast something into a particular shape. Form. So doctrine means the teaching of God's word. You see, the doctrine, the teaching of God's word is like presenting or putting people into a dye. So their lives can be formed. Are you with me? Let me repeat it. Verse 17. God be thanked that you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Or which to which you were delivered. That means the doctrine, the form of teaching. The die into which, the die of teaching into which you were cast. 
by which you were molded, shaped, formed, fashioned. The teaching of God's word is so important because it's going to shape you as a believer. So the kind of teaching you sit under, the kind of teaching you receive is shaping your life. And verse 18, it can set you free from sin, all kinds of bondages, everything. So please don't sleep when the word of God's being taught. <laughs> <laughs> because it can change your life forever. Amen? So in chapter 7, he says, you know, we are no longer under the law. That is chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We are no longer under the law. Just like a woman who's, who's dead, she's no, longer she's no longer, she's free to get married to another. Because her husband's dead. Similarly, we are dead to the law, but we are now married to Jesus Christ. So we're no longer under the law. The law was good. The Lord served a purpose. It made us aware of sin. But unfortunately, the more, more you became aware of the law, the more we wanted to break it. So you're speeding to the traffic light. You know orange means slow down, red means stop. The more you know it, the more you want to. Speed. That's human tendency. But why is that tendency there? Because he says, sin dwells in me. That is, in my flesh, there is no good thing. The law of sin is working in my flesh. Sin is a law now, meaning it's controlling my flesh, my body. That is Paul's, that is a problem which all of us as believers face. But the good news is we don't have to stay in that problem too long. Because he's leading us into the solution. Are you with me? In fact, Paul cries out in, in Romans 7. He says, oh wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This death doomed body. My body is so full of sin. Sin only brings death. Who's going to set me free? Then he says, God be thanks that through our Lord Jesus Christ, we are set free. And then he goes into Romans chapter 8. This is the answer. Verse 1. You all with me so far? I'm getting to ready to land the plane. <laughs> right. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That is, even though you're struggling with the flesh, there is no condemnation. God is not condemning. Don't worry. God understands. There is therefore now no condemnation. But here's the key. We walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the flesh has its pull. We are not denying it. In fact, let me say this, and I've mentioned this before. As long as we live in the flesh, we'll have this. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He said, you know, I mean, this is the great Apostle Paul. He's preached so much, and yet he says, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep my body under and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become a discarded thing, should be a castaway. So look, I preach to others, but I still have to keep my body in subjection. Keep it under. That's, so as long as we have, you know, we will have the struggle. But what is the answer? We walk not in accordance to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the, Romans 8 verse 2. The law of the spirit of life, that is the dominion, the influence, the rule of the life-giving spirit. Has set me free from the law of sin and death. So let's say it together. The presence. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. No. The presence. The influence. The work of the Holy Spirit 
in my life has set me free from the dominion of sin and death. That's the meaning of verse 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ. So this only happens in Christ. If you're not in Christ, the other thing pulls you down. Sin pulls us down. But in Christ, the Holy Spirit is working. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the dominion, the law of sin and death. So God, this is God's answer. God says, I've dealt with the old man. I've broken the power of sin over your life. I know you've got a problem with your flesh, which is the desires of your body and mind. But here's my answer. I am sending you the Holy Spirit to live in you. He is going to help you win over this battle with the flesh. But you have to walk according to the Spirit. That means follow Him. Okay, this may not be a good picture, but it helps. Suppose you have a nice little dog and you are walking the dog. I'm not saying you and I are dogs. <laughs> But it's a little picture. What, what does the dog do? Walks according to the must. That's all. That's all you and I have to do. Walk according to the spirit. Okay. If you don't like it, it's okay. <laughs> the illustration. <laughs> the point is just walk in line and in step yielded uh, to the Holy Spirit. That's all. Walk according to the what will happen? He says that when we walk according to the Spirit, we meet all the requirements of the law and beyond. For what the law he could not do, God did by sending Jesus. And in, 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 in Christ, verse 3, he condemned sin. He broke the power of sin. So that, verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the Spirit flesh, but according to the Spirit. That means you will do beyond what the law requires when you walk according to the Holy Spirit. But how do we do that? He says, we must not be carnally minded, but we must be spiritually minded. That means don't focus your attention on pleasing the desires, the unclean desires of your body and mind. Don't focus on it. Because he warns us there in Romans 8. He says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal man, he does, for the flesh, it's, it says, we, it does not please God. It doesn't please God. So here's the problem. If we don't make the transition from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded, what will happen is this. We are saved, we are born again, we are living under grace, we are justified, we are righteous, but we are going to be having trouble for ourselves and creating trouble for everybody else. What's the problem? Carnally minded. You're in the church, you're a believer, you love God, you're in grace, but you're not pleasing to God as far as your lifestyle is concerned. And you're causing trouble for yourself and other people. Are you understanding? So we need to make the shift. I'm not being carnally minded. I should be spiritually minded. Set my affection on things above. Set my affection on things that please God. Then you will have life and peace. Right? I want to highlight verse 13. Romans 8 verse 13. You're still with me? Romans 8 verse 13. If you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, crucify, some Bibles will say mortify, some Bibles will say put to death. If you, by the Spirit, crucify, the deeds of your body, you will live. If you, by the Spirit, so not on your own, not by your willpower, not by 
some new idea. But if you by the Spirit put to death the sinful deeds of your body, you will live. So here's the answer. By the Spirit, I put to death the sinful deeds of my body. So I asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, please help me. I'm struggling with this. He knows it already, so it's nothing new. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I'm struggling with this. It could be anger. It could be lust. It could be jealousy. It could be whatever in the soul or the body. But by the Spirit, you put to death. Amen? I'm going to skip down to verse 26. Likewise. So in the same manner, he's talked about a lot of other things I'm skipping. But verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Amen? The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So let me illustrate. Rohan, come on. And uh, come, both of you come. come. Okay, just jump on. This. Quick, quick, quick. Come. Just jump on. Okay. Okay. Illustration, okay? Now, Rohan is standing behind me. Kevin, please stand this side. Let's do arm wrestling. Okay. This is Kevin. He's a good boy. But for the illustration, let's think of him as the bad desires of my flesh. Okay, Kevin? Is it okay? <laughs> so I'm struggling. I'm wrestling, Kevin. Come on. Ah! So I'm trying to overcome this desire of the flesh. It's not working. I'm struggling. I attend seminar. Not working. I attend weekend school, not working. I mean, I do all kinds of things to overcome the weakness of this flesh. It's not working. And now comes Rowan, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> On my side, Rowan, please <laughs> hold your hand against me. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Come on, Rohan. Let's do it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> the Holy Spirit helps us, us, in our weaknesses. The Greek word is a big compound word, which means he takes a hold together with us against. That's why I thought arm wrestling is a good illustration. He takes a hold together with us against our weakness. Meaning, if you don't want it to overcome it, he's not going to help you. But if you want to overcome it, he will take a hold together with you against your weakness. Amen? So I ask him, Holy Spirit, I've been trying on my own. It's not working. But I want to overcome this. Holy Spirit, help me. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. He takes a hold together with us against our weakness. Part of that taking a hold together with us against our weakness involves prayer. Because that verse continues. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. God, I want to overcome this weakness. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to bind or lose. Sometimes I bind, sometimes I lose. I don't know whether to cast it out or call it in. I don't know whether to pray here or pray there. I mean, you get all kinds of messages from everywhere. I don't know how to pray for as I should. Too much, Lord. I don't know. Some people, when they pray for me, they bind it. Some people, when they pray for me, they lose it. <laughs> I don't know what they're praying. For we don't know what to pray for as we ought. What happens? He helps us 
in our weaknesses. How? He makes intercession. The word there is for us, but because of the first word there, you can say he makes intercession with us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this references us praying in the Spirit. Very important. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. He's going to take a hold of together with you against your weakness. Against your weakness. The Holy Spirit is the answer. Amen? I'll read for a couple of verses. We'll close. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Walk yielded to the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is the answer. We all have problems. This is the answer. Walk in the Spirit. Then he says in verse 24, Galatians 5, 24, They that are Christ's, those who belong to Christ, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Isn't that wonderful? That by the Spirit, you can actually crucify those desires. Ungodly, I'm talking. We have good desires, enjoy it. Wrong desires, crucify it. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How? With the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've gone forward in our journey. We are standing in grace. Now we are walking victorious in the Spirit. Amen? It's okay if you're still at that point. Now you can move. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. God has taken care of the old man. I will declare sin will not have dominion over me. And I'm going to yield myself to God. I'm going to become a slave to God. I'll say, God, you're my master. And I'm going to look to the Holy Spirit. Now we can walk like this. Amen? Amen? Now, remember, it's not a switch that you flip. It's a journey you make. Amen? That means with the Holy Spirit. He's taking a hold of together with you against those weaknesses. And he'll help you overcome. So that from glory to glory, we are changed into that same image of Jesus Christ. Amen? But one thing you and I can be assured, there is no sin that can so dominate you which the Holy Spirit cannot get rid out of you. Because He is more powerful than any of these things. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. I'll just call our worship team up. So, as we heard the word of God this, this morning, the purpose of the word, the doctrine, is, is, is to shape our lives, is to mold our lives. He says, but God be thanked that you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine unto which you were delivered. Being set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So that word that comes, it comes to set us free. So I want just to lead us in a few moments that you can appropriate. You can take that freedom into your life. Whatever area of life that you want God to work in. This word that comes can set you free. So I'll just lead us in a simple declaration of what we heard. And then I just want to pray over us. Sometimes, and I'm not saying this to frighten us, but sometimes some areas of our lives are actually energized by unclean spirits. They're actually, that's why they call unclean spirits. 
that means some compulsive habitual controlling sins are not just weakness of your flesh yes they are but they're compounded by the presence of unclean spirits so you've actually got to resist those spirits unclean spirits you can do it yourself just say in Jesus name I reject those spirits that are behind that addiction or behind that sin in my life that's controlling me I reject I resist those spirits but I just want to also pray over us that's another way when somebody prays for you those spirits leave that's the work of the anointing of the Holy Spirit there may be some manifestation there may not be any manifestation it's not about the manifestation it's about the leaving of those spirits it's about the breaking of those bondages that you leave from this place knowing you're free and that's the fruit that we are after that there'll be freedom in every area of our lives amen so let's just pray let's just say this together I know that my old man was crucified the power of sin over my life has been broken I am dead to sin I am free from sin I count myself dead to sin I present my body and every part of my body as a slave unto God it's a weapon of righteousness I present all my appetites all my desires all my affections all my sexual appetites unto God they are slaves unto God I welcome the empowering of the Holy Spirit the presence of the Holy Spirit has set me free from the power of sin and death I walk in the Spirit I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh I who belong to Christ I have crucified my flesh with its passions and desires Christ is formed in me Christ is seen in me I walk in the spirit amen let's pray father we thank you for your word that your word has power to set us free So right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over sins of the flesh and things of the soul that have bound people present here. Anyone, anyone, in any way, any form, any fashion. I take authority over every unclean spirit. I take authority over every foul spirit of darkness. And I expel it out. Out of the soul. Out of the body. In the name of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I break every bondage. Every yoke. Every burden. And I declare God's people free. In the name of Jesus. Every controlling. Addictive. Behavior. Energize men, clean spirits. I break the power of those things. In Jesus' name. And declare God's people free. Free to walk in righteousness. Free to walk in holiness. Free to walk in purity. Free to walk according to the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're going to go out. You're going to find freedom. You're going to discover that certain areas of your life that you once struggled with will no longer be a struggle. 
It'll not be a struggle anymore. You'll walk in freedom. Amen? Let's close. And then we will sing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. If you want to just stand and worship for a while, you're welcome to do that. I'll hand it off. Worship. My chains are gone. I've been saved.